is a charming theater. It was built as a concert hall, a little concert hall. And um, it has, you know, it has a lot of charm, but it was small. And it was actually some of the interesting things about it were that, that it didn't have, the, 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 anyway, the rumor was that, that Carnegie didn't really want it to be a theater. So they kind of hid some things. And the and there was a paint frame in the in the in the building, but the only way to get to it was around and about through kind of catacombs in the basement, and uh, and the paint frame you know you know went down near the, there are niches in the outside of, of the building and it it was kind of backing on the, the niches, and not many people knew that it was there, but we could use it. Except in order, if you, if you put a drop on it, I mean, it went up and down. If you put a drop on it, you then would roll it up and then you'd take it up to the balcony and then you'd walk it through this catacomb and then get it back to the stage. But because it was kind of an unknown space, some students actually that didn't have much money lived down in that space and nobody knew they were there. Um, so it was, it was, it had, you know, it had its uh, charm. And I know that one of the, my favorite stories was the, uh, in the theater itself, the, lighting situation the, the in the overhead lights in the auditorium there were catwalks up there and one of my very favorite people then was a man named William Nelson and Bill was very dry uh, and very funny but in his own very dry way and so rumor has it that uh, he was showing some people through the theater at one time and suddenly there was this crack and some legs came through because somebody had gotten off the catwalk and come through the ceiling. So they were just legs and all he did was stop and say, that's going to be expensive, and then went on. So, um, but and it, was, it, it was good, it was, just, it was just cramped. When we moved over from the College of Fine Arts to the Margaret Morrison building, um, we did have a room that we devoted just to storage over there, which was very nice, but it was absolutely insufficient. And so we kept looking around for places and we discovered in the third basement of Margaret Morrison, there were two large rooms, one of which was being used kind of as a storage room by, by the bookstore. And the other one was the firing range for ROTC. Um, so, we thought, well, gee, the bookstore really doesn't deserve all this space. I mean, the rooms were very big and, and tall. And so we thought, well, we could, we could really use these, but they didn't have, because of the firing range situation, there was troughs and things in it so that the floors weren't all flat or anything. And in order to get it flat, we said, well, we've got to do something about this. Now, the only way you could get to them by going in the elevator on the inside the building, or there was a long stairway on the outside of the building next to what was then the football stadium, which has only moved it a little bit since then. Um, and so in order to, to get the floor that we needed in the time that we needed it for, we got a bunch of the students and, and Cletus and I and some of the other faculty and we carried buckets of concrete down these outside stairs and we made our own floor. And, and uh, then we got, then we brought in, you know, like three story uh, hanging spaces. And uh, it was great. And the only problem, of course, that building had cockroaches. And, but I got very used to, you just, you went to the door and you opened the door and you stood there and stamped your feet a little bit and turned the light on and then you let them run because they were big cockroaches. But they did not come from, from the movie Creepshow. There were rumors that that's why there are cockroaches in Margaret Morrison. Margaret Morrison grew its own cockroaches. But basically, you know, working with George was, was okay. He, he lived it all. I mean, he devoted himself to, to all of those things. And, and he, as I said, he was very collaborative. He would, for example, if he was thinking about doing something, he would, he always would send me over a copy of the script to see, or, 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 or the book and say, we're, we're thinking about doing this, when it was one of, of Stephen's things, Stephen King's stuff. And uh, so I'd have to, because 
I was the fastest reader in the family, so I'd run through it. Cletus first met him because we'd been doing a lot of productions with uh, WQED at a time when they were doing a lot of historical things. And um, so George had done all of these, move, these movies that he'd done around town, and they'd kind of, you know, everybody would pitch in and make a movie. Um, so he didn't have much in the way of designers associated with it. And when he got Knight Riders, it, ne it needed designers. So he was talking to people, and some of the people that we'd worked with had worked with him, and they suggested that he talk to Cletus. So uh, Cletus went to talk to him and came back and said, well, he's got this movie, and he's thinking that maybe, you know, we should work on it. And uh, so we decided to, and it was... Uh, it was a bit nervous making and very exciting at the same time and um, it, very, it kept us even busier because we really had been with all the stuff that we'd been doing for QED we had you know a pretty full plate with things that was a, a, a kind of a big thing Night Riders was getting that done because they you had you had all the stuff all the, the regular clothes things and all the medieval clothes things and the fact that the uh, the stunt riders had to have doubles. They had to have doubles on all their stuff. And it had to be flexible enough that they could fit any number of people because the stunt riders got paid more when they did the tougher stunts. And so they would trade off. And because they were, you know... They were leather things. We made them, you know, adaptable with buckles and things like that. And they had helmets and and, uh, and helmet liners, and they could go on so that that we could a adapt uh, pretty well. But it was it was always keeping you on your toes. So uh, Creep Show had a, there there was um, there, this one thing which which Ted Danson was in, where he gets buried alive in the sand and uh, and then comes back to life. And it was, uh, at the time, he had a, a daughter and his wife was there, not the one, he, not his current wife, but, uh, uh, and they, and then, and the daughter was, I think, probably about three. And so they were very, you know, we were trying to be very cautious when he was made up as he came back after he drowned and was all, you know, uh, not to have, uh, so that she wouldn't see her dad looking like that. And, and then at one point, somehow she got away from somebody and she ran over and she said, hey, daddy. <laughs> you know, didn't bother her at all. <laughs> she knew it was her daddy and that was, and it was fine. We all thought that was pretty amusing. That was an interesting, because he was around, Steve was around a lot for the shooting of that uh, movie. He actually had come out and had been an extra in Creep, in uh, Night Riders. And that's how he and, and and uh, George kind of got together, and they, they were good buddies. They would, you know, they were both about the same size. They're both tall guys, and, uh, and they both had very strange imaginations, and so then they would feed off each other on that thing. George had a real place in his heart for the zombies. You know, that was, he was kind of amazed that it, it had taken off like it did, um, but you could tell that, that he, you know, he, he really felt that, that you had to, you had to kind of understand what they were and what they were looking for, and and know how they would react. Um, so that was you know that was the the part of the whole thing of deciding, okay, what was you know when we started getting when Bub started to be kind of having you know he, he, Bub was was kind of lovable in certain ways, and. Um, you had to kind of, you know, let that happen, even though that the, the doctor that was operating on them was not lovable at all. He was crazy. But um, you, you did have to have a, a feeling for the zombies. And, and, it, and it was amazing because people came from miles around to be zombies. Uh, Sidney Lauper came once to be a zombie. Uh, and uh, there was one rock band that came in to be a zombie, and then, and it was just, you know, being a zombie was important to people.